Um, it means everything else that you don't know about Peter <laughs> uh, People know PwC is a accounting firm, audit, tax, legal, consulting. Um, started last July. We set up a separate line of service called Party Service. So what's Party Service? We feel whatever that China needs the most should be our priority. And our purpose is to solve important problems, especially in China. So under priority services, we have four business units. Education is one of them, which is PwC Plus, which we just launched earlier this year. And we're the first license in China that's owned by a foreign you know, company, foreign brand. Uh, food safety is another priority service. We actually have a couple of folks from our food safety group sitting here in the audience also. And Clara, we're obviously another uh, company that we collaborate with in the food sector or industry. And uh, infrastructure, uh, just yesterday we signed an MOU with uh, Xinhua uh, News Agency uh, to publish a series of books for the Bell and Road Initiative in the next three years. So we largely focus on all the infrastructure projects in China uh, for PPP, for government funding, and as well as the Bell and Road uh, projects that we have been started doing. And last but not least, we have an urbanization team that we try to be advisors for local government, especially mayors and vice mayors, district mayors. It's complicated. Everybody knows things are complicated in China. So how can we bring our experience and knowledge and to the local government who will then give out policies that could make positive impact for the people and the community that live here? So we feel we need to align the government more and therefore we organize the urbanization team in uh, priority services. So I have so many different roles, but what I feel most proud of is PwC U+. And that's a program that we designed, especially for the younger generation, like 25, 26 year old people. And it's about how to collaborate you know, between what you learn in the classroom and what you actually do in the actual workplace. But what we feel that's lacking many times is that you walk into a classroom, you can feel you learn. Once you walk out, get into the real work environment, you feel you forget everything. So in our program, Students will spend six months in the classroom learning from the best and the brightest. However, another six months they're actually working. You know, three three months they will be working in PwC. Another three months they will be working in one of the Fortune 500 companies like Conagra, like LVMH, like even for some of the new industries like Oriental Greenworks. You know, um, so there are lots and lots of things to be learned from the actual workplace. Um, I don't want to take up too, too much of the time here, but we do have a series of events coming up starting from this Saturday. Uh, you'll feel free to uh, scan our barcode at the front registration desk, and please do stop by because we now offer experience classes uh, during those events. Thank you very much. So, any um, just briefly, because this is English, we will speak 中文介绍其实我的开头是创新服务部主管合伙人创新服务部里面我的目标是做一些对社会特别是中国社会和老百姓有意义的事情那无非就是读书难找工作难看医生难吃的食品安全没有信息所以在这些领域里面我们都希望
my, I, I think um, this is timely to give her a new nickname, which is China Wonder Woman. She's really one of my inspirational role models, and I'm so happy to be friends with her and to work on events like this with you. So I'd like to introduce Fiona Gong upstage as well, just to introduce this concept of this beautiful venue that we're at. Sorry, the boy friends, we're not we're not showing you the venue, but it's just you can sorry, I'm just gonna get them again. Yeah, and it's just like beautiful design. So Fiona, as community manager of Naked Hub, can I ask you to explain this concept of co-working now? Uh okay, don't know what okay. Uh我们的这个联合办公的概念呢，其实跟传统的这个办公室的概念会有点不一样。因为大家可能知道，在座大家可能在一些传统的办公室里面工作的话，一般都是以这个啊平方啊这种面积啊来算你们的这个位置。但是我
to stand up and just wave hello. Please say hello to them. Hello. hello. Um, these people from around the world are dedicating themselves to work at Juice and help us create play-based food education to really change the way people eat and therefore improve everything from environment to personal health to economic health and societal health. So, with that, ready for a little conversation? You got your microphone? Good? Okay, I think we've got... There we go. There's our lovely faces, Leslie. <laughs> so, Leslie and I know each other from an organization called the World Economic Forum, Young Global Leaders, uh, which is an amazing organization because it crosses so many countries and so many sectors, but everybody is chosen because they want to improve the state of the world. They truly believe that they're, they exist to be in service for others. So I want to obviously talk about the great work that you're doing, but go beyond that and understand why it is that you've chosen to spend your life being in service to people. So perhaps we can start with this phenomenal concept called New Development Bank. What does that mean? What is it? Other than a hundred billion dollars, which like, I, I can't count that high, right? A hundred billion dollars. Thank you very much, uh, Peggy. Thanks for uh, having me, and uh, thanks to all of you. I was a bit uh, nervous and worried about uh, you know us having the room filled, so I have a number of colleagues here from the New Development Bank, so just in case the room is filled, I thought we'll have uh, let me just ask Make sure you clap loudly, <laughs> okay? Uh, let me just introduce, introduce to you a, um, a good number of people from uh, the bank that we just started uh, two years ago. Maybe you just turn up for 10 seconds, or 5 seconds for people to talk to you afterwards. Thank you very much. I'll be very brief about uh, the bank. Uh, when Peggy arranged the uh, session tonight, I think the aim is for us to have a conversation on, on a couple of uh, themes. But I'd like to just start out by talking about what was, what was the drive and the inspiration behind this uh, uh, formation of this institution. So, as you know, the world has been dominated for the last probably 150 years by a few large uh, economies, in particular by the United States. In the post-World War period, especially after 1944, in a whole range of institutions that have been set up, the World Bank, IMF, what is known as the Bretton Woods institutions. And these institutions are really controlled, dominated in all respects, in terms of governance arrangements, in terms of veto powers that exist, in many, many other uh, respects. In fact, one of the most bizarre uh, aspects of multilateral banking. And as you know, multilateralism means that multiple countries are involved in the case of multilateral banks, typically over 150, 180 countries belong to many of these uh, institutions. But I'll give you an example of, of that, uh, uh, what I call bizarre strange arrangements. Today, after 74 years of existence, the World Bank has always and uh, still is run by an American citizen. And yet, the institution has 192 countries as members. So everybody is welcome to apply, and only one country can uh, appoint. By 1944, the United States was uh, more than 50% of the world economy. So you can understand that there was a much, a much stronger influence that the United States had in the world uh, and so on. But the world has fundamentally changed in the last uh, 50, 70 years, specifically in the last 30 years. And the last 30 years have been defined by the rise of China. Uh, we'll talk a little bit later more about China, its sustainability record, and all of those things are very interesting. But over the last 30 years, China and India in particular have uh, arisen as two of the most uh, 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 impressive emerging uh, markets and will continue to grow to become significant economies in the global sphere. So, just to then fast forward to the new development bank, how did it come about? So over the last uh, 10, 15 years, these countries led by China have been arguing for reform in the, in the world uh, multilateral system for China, India, Brazil, these large countries to have a bigger say in the running of, of uh, the global uh, governance uh, system. And they've been unsuccessful in doing so. So there are a series of new institutions emerging 
uh, in the world. One of them is called the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank, it's based in Beijing, AIIB in short. New Development Bank is another based here. It's also Silk Road Fund, and we'll talk about the White Belt Fund Road, maybe later on as well, to be set up. So, and these are significant institutions. They have more than $200 billion in capital, uh, um, and with that reach, they will have, in terms of reach over the next 10, 15 years, it will make a significant difference in the world in terms of both infrastructure and sustainable uh, development. Can we just um, talk a little bit about numbers? So NTB, New Development Bank, is $100 billion, is that the idea? Yeah. Okay, and then... Well, without going into this, so, uh, a detail of capital structure and how it works, but we have 100 billion of authorized capital, uh, and that is broken down as follows. First, $10 billion is equity or paving capital, that's real money that governments put into the bank. Uh, $40 billion of that is called uh, uh, callable capital, a form of a guarantee. So what the government say, when you need that, you can, you can have it. And the other $50 billion is um, uh, uh, still unsubscribed, meaning we get new members in, and then we will move up to the full $100 billion. That's uh, $100 billion. Social. And then we've got AIIB, which is another $100 billion. Huh? And then Silk, uh, Silk Infrastructure Fund, which is $40 billion. Another uh, and then, are there any other banks that we should be aware of that are sort of new alternative banks? Look, the, there are many about 25 new financial banks, uh, that it, but most of them have been established a long time ago. 70 years ago, 60 years ago, Asian Development Bank, 50 years ago, European uh, Investment Bank, uh, 40 years ago, uh, CAF in Latin America, and so on. But the most recent formations, the most recent uh, institutions are IIB and so some people have called the New Development Bank the New World Bank. How do you feel about that? I would say that um, the shorthand description for the New Development Bank would be uh, a bank for emerging markets. It will be 80% always in terms of its articles of agreement or its statute. 80% of the bank will always be controlled by emerging markets. So you know, eventually when the bank opens up, large countries Large countries uh, like Indonesia, Mexico, Vietnam, all of these new emerging markets will also join. Uh, but the AIIB is more a new world bank right? because they already have 80 members. They put much more global reach, and it's clear that China has much greater uh, global aspirations for the uh, AIIB. So I can tell from your accent that you're not from these parts. No, I'm actually from uh, South Africa, born and uh, bred. Beautiful country for those of you who haven't uh, visited. Uh, we have one or two South Africans here. Uh, so I've lived in South Africa up until up until I moved here two years ago. So how do you like China so far? China is an amazing, uh, amazing uh, city. In fact, my first lunch here was with you actually in, uh, in Shanghai uh, almost two years ago. Now it's amazing how time flies. But for me, what has been uh, an incredible experience, having worked for large uh, investment banks, worked for tax, markets, capital, uh, and so on, but uh, the, the challenge, the real opportunity and privilege of coming here where there was nothing in place, no infrastructure, no staff, uh, you know, no email, no technology, nothing, uh, and having to step it up from scratch. So something about the uh, humility that comes with knowing what you don't know, and having to break things down into its component parts, and it's really about a startup. I'm sure many of you here probably run your own companies. Uh, it is both exciting and intimidating because you uh, worry about what can go wrong. Uh, everything is new. So, and just to give context, when you say a startup, you mean like you moved here and there was a little tiny office, and you're like, how do they start up a bank? Like everything, right? Obviously, the, the bank had uh, capital, we had money, so it's a different kind of startup. Uh, for a funded startup, maybe. Normally, when you have a startup, you worry about where the salaries will come from or paying the rent in the facility, you have to worry about that. Because one of the great uh, advantages we had is that we based in China, and the Chinese government, Ministry of Finance, and the Shanghai Municipal Government, our host, have made available the most incredible facilities. We have beautiful offices. We had the most basic infrastructure, but nothing else. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, I mean, you probably had to worry about where are you going to do your printing? All of that. All of that, right? How do you get email? Yeah. 
Yeah, so everything that you guys are doing, probably, startups, like he had to do, but for, to manage a hundred billion dollars. Isn't that crazy? It's crazy. No, so, to, can you just give me like this a little tidbit story about, um, you know, when you're in Beijing, you meet with all these really high-level Chinese government officials, and then you bring in the president of South Africa or other leading delegates. Can you just give us a fun, colorful story to show what it's like? to be in those circles? Uh, colorful uh, stories about Chinese uh, eating. It's uh, obviously very ceremonial in uh, character, very structured. Uh, I don't think there's really fun moments when you meet with... Can you with people who maybe not, who've never been in, you know, Yaoi Thai, maybe they're from the US and watching my camera right now on Facebook or whatever. What is it like? I, mean, I think the, for me, um, uh, when I came here, I have to say I think a very different uh, understanding and appreciation of what the Chinese state really is uh, about. Because I think uh, people here carry the, the mantle of that, that history. You know, this is a civilization that's 5,000 years old. It's not a, a government that uh, could be, you know, will be elected out of power in five years' uh, time. Uh, so there's something very uh, unique about the uh, about the Chinese uh, government in that uh, respect. But as I said, things are much more methodical, much more uh, circumscribed. We do not have the, the ebbs and flow that you would have in a, in a normal uh, democracy. The upside, I have to say, about a, a Chinese uh, political uh, system is the value of long term strategic planning. The, the, um, Infrastructure plans, the Shanghai infrastructure plans, all the large tier one cities. They are 20-year plans, they are 50-year uh, plans. It's unreal. There are very, very few parts of the world where you would have anything to that degree of uh, sophistication. Because uh, Singapore would be definitely one of the most far-sighted uh, governments in the world. But most governments, because they are democratic uh, impulses or democratic moments where they might be out of power, uh, you know, those plans might change, etc. Um, the, the difference here is that you have a single party in uh, power. Obviously, downsides to, uh, to that too, but, but that is one of the most easy values that you have in the system. Okay, but I'm looking for something juicier, because like they're sitting here, and you know, I want to entertain them. So I'll give you an example. I remember years ago, we used to do these Juice China Clean Energy Forums and bring in delegations from abroad, the head of the U.S. Department of Energy here or something like that. And we'd have 50 mayors and we'd be uh, demoing things like the net zero village. And uh, we would have buses of these delegates and they would just part the highways for us. Right? You'd have police cars in front, police cars in back. And this is before, you know, before. <laughs> three years ago. But that, and then the head of the U.S. DOE turned to me and was like, wow. Like, even when we try to organize this, we don't get this <laughs> type of perception. So, I like for me, that's just a China moment. Yeah, it's going to be a China moment. There, there, there are many China moments uh, like that. I remember going to uh, Chengdu, the uh, G20, and uh, Chengdu, for those of you who uh, don't know, the all the pandas uh, um, are. And, um, you know, again, yeah, it was uh, a very long, uh, probably like a 15 minute uh, ride with a single car. Obviously, the entire place was cleared for that particular moment of the leaders of the G20 to stay in the Eastern Bank Banks. The same with Hangzhou last year. In September last year, President Xi hosted all these other uh, presidents, and Hangzhou probably has 87, 8 million people, something of that, that order of magnitude. And uh, if you know the West Lake, uh, etc., it's out of those people all the time. Was a single person uh, sort of behavior. So, so what you described, I've seen, I've seen those kind of China moments many times. So, okay, that wasn't quite as colorful as I wanted, but okay, um, we'll move on. <laughs> so, Leslie, I have to say, I'm going to compliment you because, you know, we've known each other for a while, and I, I've seen you move through a few positions. And this one, obviously, is like taking the cake, but this entire time, you really have stayed grounded. I'd like to like just tell you how grateful I am for being grounded and um I, 
or such a rock star for, for simple language, to <laughs> stay so grounded. It, like you, you keep in touch with your friends, like little me, right? You really make an effort. Um, I see you on social media, really like reaching, complimenting people, saying, "Hey, that's great," you know, and like you're not just sort of in this elite stratosphere. And I sort of feel like that's not just born into some. I mean, like yeah, you could be born in this, but. I don't know. I mean, I sort of feel like other forces in your life probably shaped how grounded you are. And I know a little bit about your life, but perhaps you can share share a little bit about maybe your athleticism, your 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 your, your past career, uh, because before you became a finance rock star, and then also some, maybe if you're willing to share um, some stories about South Africa. It's quite remarkable. Uh, certainly, I, I, I would not you know, use this rock star thing that you uh, know, use twice now. It's just a break from that. But um, can I think that you realize in life, especially as you grow sort of older, right, that you know, positions and offices you hold are sort of transient moments. And ultimately, it's what you are about as a person that is the enduring aspect of uh, who you are. And, uh, you know, Positions is really just that. There are sort of uh, you know, a, a momentary recognition where you have a set of responsibilities associated with that particular uh, organization. And ultimately, it's your, your warmth as a human being, your, your own humanity that, that defines you. And, and that you know, is not something that you can uh, fabricate. Um, and in my case, I mean, you know, I, mean, I grew up in a uh, large family. I have six brothers and, si uh, brothers and sisters, uh, two most of the Chinese. Uh, people here are, you know, don't have brothers and sisters, so, you know, that, that, that's quite something to grow up a big uh, family uh, like that. But I think I've also been, you know, blessed with having, you know, dedicated uh, parents and having had very dedicated mentors in my life, who I look up to, who I respected, people who kind of instilled a sense of purpose uh, in me, who made me realize that life is more than just you. You know, I think it's so easy, baby, to seduce me to your own individual aspirations, your own uh, achievements, etc. But I think as you grow older, as you move on, uh, you realize that you need to combine those individual aspirations, achievements, and ambitions you have with that sense of uh, purpose to make a difference. Ultimately, what matters is what footprint you and I left uh, behind. Achievements mean nothing. As they say, the richest man or person in the cemetery means nothing. What were some of the key moments in your younger self that shaped that wanting that purpose in life? I grew up in South Africa and you paint a very brief picture for those of you who don't uh, know about South Africa and its history. So I am of uh, mixed uh, race, right? So I uh, grew up under apartheid uh, when apartheid laws were still uh, in place. And apartheid, in a, in a nutshell, I think it explain in 30 seconds, but essentially it was a political system where the government of the day, there was someone who believed that people need to be separated, grow up in their own communities, to kind of form what they call self-development, uh, uh, but incredibly discriminatory uh, policies and practices is, is, is what defined my early sort of uh, childhood. Growing up, I went to a, a crash that was just kids that look like me in this place, uh, people who are Indian descent to go to an Indian uh, creation school, uh, etc. Uh, your post, post office, the clinic, uh, everything, right? So your friends are your immediate sort of uh, uh, environment that you're surrounded with. It's a very bizarre sort of uh, um, existence. And it was a system which it was very clear to me that it was unjust because there were opportunities that I did not have that my fellow black South Africans did not have. So I became a political activist at a very young age. Uh, just at school, you know, at high school, I was 13, 14 years old, you know, asking teachers the hard questions, um, uh, you know, around educational facilities, because, you know, I went to school that was very, very poorly equipped, uh, did not have the most basic uh, infrastructure. Right. The school I went to would be about 45 years old now, that school, and it's still a prefab, it was a temporary structure. Not even a big, uh, uh, proper looking model building. So, these were the most, kind of, for me actually, what pissed me off most about the part of now, when I was maybe six years old, people asked me, how, 
when did you realize something wrong with, with uh, your society? I said, my dad drove us to the beach, to beaches and, um, uh, you know, the sub beaches that we couldn't go to. Like, I love swimming. I always love the sea and water and the beach and stuff. And there was a beach defined in Port Elizabeth, which is the city I grew up in, beach defined for white South Africans, and I said, beach, obviously. Uh, beach defined for colored South Africans, because this place, beach defined for Africans and so on. So, I got involved in political uh, activism, organized students, became chairman of the Student Representative Council at my school, established the, the, the organization because I realized only to connect the power by organizing people that you can change things. So, um, that became a vehicle for, for my involvement and that led to you know, much more serious activism in the form of leading demonstrations and so on. And, um, culminated in, uh, you know, being arrested a couple of times, spending time in uh, prison. But all of that, for me, was a profound uh, learning experience because it was a collective experience. I felt that was part of something that was, that was transformational and that, that was not just about me. You know. So the, the suffering under apartheid came with that sort of, uh, you know, badge that you knew you were working in the, in the, in the broader public. Wow. Well, well, that definitely. How much time did you spend in jail? Um, I was in total for uh, 15 months. So I was put for for one full year, uh, 1969, 19 years old, uh, and it was under what is called the state of emergency. So basically, the uh, under state of emergency. For those of you who don't know what state of emergency is, like martial law. So basically, the government declares that. Uh, and essentially suspends all laws. So what, what that means is that you don't have access to legal representation, you can't go into a court to contest your arrest. We call equivalent the policeman walking in here now and handpicking 10, 15, 20, 30 people, or all of us, and arresting you. Uh, you can make a phone call and let someone know where you're going to, but uh, you can stay there for as long as they want to keep you. So you can get released after two weeks, after a month, after three months, in my case, I came on after a year. Some of my friends stayed two years, were arrested at the same time as me, a uh, couple stayed for three years as well. So, what did you, like, what's the thing that kept you positive for that long? That, you know, the, there's a good sense of solidarity, firstly, when, you, when you're in a prison. When you go through any bad experience, there's an earthquake here now, and you're all in trouble, you know, it's the solidarity that will be the most important aspect about that experience, not your individual discomfort because you're all in discomfort, right? So the first thing is that you have this incredible camaraderie. I should maybe just sketch what a prison condition sort of like if you're a political detainee. So they don't mix political detainees with uh, criminals. So that's the first good thing about being a political detainee. So you're not mixed with you know, members and uh, uh, thieves and uh, etc. So you are with uh, people who are Number two, the, you are aware, although you don't have access to newspapers, no access to television, no access to radio, no access to the outside world, you do know in your heart of hearts that there is a very strong sense of support you have from the community outside. And therefore, that uh, drive and impetus is, is what's the inspiration behind you know, keeping you. Uh, you strong. Wow. So, was the track after or before? Or were you an athlete? No, no, I was an athlete as a, I was an athlete as a, as a teenager, so, so I was not running. So, I, I think like people who are athletes and then people who have been through this sort of um, bonding moment, this rough bonding moment. Uh, can take that into sort of entrepreneurship by sort of being this, like if you go back to the people here in the audience, I mean, what, what are some of the things that you took away that make these people who want to be entrepreneurs stronger? What can they take away? Without going to invest too much. As I said, you know, the, uh, the belief that individuals, uh, obviously very inspirational individuals, Mandela, many such 
So what is your, your investment size? What is, what's your scope for sustainable finance? So let me talk about NDB very briefly and then to talk a bit more broadly about what's happening in this thing that I call green finance, for example, of which green bonds is, is just one uh, component. In the case of the new development bank, what makes us unique as well as the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank, because we were formed very recently, we have adopted uh, and because our articles of agreement, which is the document, the legal document that establishes the bank, that document defines sustainability uh, as part of our uh, part of our mandate. Yeah, so, how many other banks do that? Well, the, the other banks were formed 10 years ago, about the other banks six years ago. So in that stage, sustainability was the word sustainability was. How many used. other banks? I don't know of any other banks that have in their legal mandate uh, to do sustainable development. They have since actually. To ADB, World Bank, IFC, they've all adopted uh, sustainability practices. Right? So uh, we are you know, uh, a newcomer to this domain, uh, but we have a legal mandate uh, enshrined in our very foundation. Now you know why the two of us are together on stage. Now, so, so, so how, do we, um, how does this um, uh, come about? I think, as I said earlier on, there's a recognition now that uh, environmental risk, whether it's also biodiversity, land degradation, water scarcity, all of the natural disasters, all of these things are interconnected. There's no more debate. It seems that in parts of the US, unfortunately, there's still a debate around whether climate change is real. There's still now some very senior policymakers saying that uh, climate change is uh, That's my head spinning. So, so, so the, the, but the global consensus is that we have to look at how we can redirect the banking system, the financial system to enable this growth towards a more sustainable long-term uh, uh, future. So I'm going to talk a little bit about how this is actually done. It is enshrined, for example, in our environmental and social and governance policies. So when a project is done, part of the, the design process part of the, the uh, project appraisal process. Environmental, social uh, considerations are, are, are right up front center in the determination of whether the bank will have to do the project. So what's your minimum investment side, the project side? Well, the bank is new, as I mentioned earlier on, and uh, we have done $1.5 billion uh, worth of, of loans uh, already. The uh, smallest at this stage uh, is about 80 million dollars. Um, uh, we probably will not be doing smaller than that because these banks, we fund large infrastructure, it's typically much, much bigger uh, projects. So for example, one offshore wind project we are basically working on is, uh, you know, runs in the billions of dollars in terms of various phases. We will fund a portion of the are. But any of these large infrastructure projects, we build a port high speed rail, uh, they're not small. Okay. Which means that none of you can go to him for Series A funding. <laughs> Sorry. Um, but I, you know, I was just in Norway and I was speaking at ONS, which is a sort of oil uh, platform for oil companies. And Stat Oil, the VP of Stat Oil was there. And he said that uh, he would like the amount of investment in new energy at Stat Oil to go from 10% to 50% which to me, I was really shocked. I mean, I knew that there was a trend bubbling up. Um, certainly the oil industry is being disrupted. But for, for somebody like that to come to the I want half, half of my <laughs> portfolio to come from new energy. I was like, wow, this is a brand new world. Either that or I'm in Norway, and it's just a very strange country. <laughs> I don't know. Well, Norway, obviously, are in uh, the leadership, not just in Scandinavia and Europe, but in the rest of the world, is in terms of sitting higher uh, benchmarks. So give you a few numbers of how fast this growth of the green market, for example, is evolving. Uh, let's take the green bond market. The green bond is essentially like a normal bond. Raise money in uh, uh, through a debt offering and you undertake that, that money will be spent on a project that is green. So in other words, you will not build a coal-fired power station for that, for that money. So you raise money from investors and you, and you legally undertake money will be spent in a particular uh, a way that will reduce carbon emissions and will not do uh, damage to the environment. 
that market started only in 2007, about 10 uh, years ago, uh, about three years ago, the market was maybe uh, 20, 25 billion uh, dollars. Since grown in 2015, it was uh, around 50 billion dollars. Last year, uh, it has uh, come close to 100 billion. This year, it's going to be 200 billion dollar market. Uh, and people project, I'm involved in the project last week that this might become a trillion dollar market by 2020, not 2020, or 2020, by 2020, which means it will double every, uh, every year. So what that means is that increasingly, and shine in the investment mandate of pension fund asset managers, there will be a requirement for you to, uh, like in Norway, uh, I'm sure they, would, they probably already have at least 5 or 10 or 15 percent of the investment mandates. When pension funds invest money, allocate money, it has to be invested in green assets. China, by the way, currently, uh, one of the leading voices in China is a guy by the name of uh, Dr. Ma Jun. He's the chief economist of PBOC, who's one of the leading thinkers uh, in, this, in the yeah, in People's Bank of China. He's one of the leading thinkers around uh, green finance. He uh, said that they are currently investigating a framework to see whether they can, um, as part of well, what's called the macro prudential assessment of banks, they want to put uh, environmental risk and stability uh, sort of uh, in there, which means that if a bank scores better, they'll be able to earn a higher interest on the capital uh, they have based on these uh, metrics. They're thinking completely out of the box. No one in the world has even come close to designing such a sophisticated regulatory um, That's very interesting. And actually, then, um, I don't know if that was in the report of green finance with Madrid and finance data. No, no, this particular idea is, uh, is something that they are discussing, but it shows you the level uh, of, of uh, sophistication that the debate is reached. What they say is that in any industry, to really um, move it and transform it fundamentally, you need to have a new regulatory framework, a new set of rules uh, that define uh, the game. And uh, they are looking in China at, for example, compulsory environmental reporting by all companies, not about banks, just all companies. One of the ideas they're also exploring. So we'll have to wait and see which of these ideas eventually get uh, accepted. Well, so what do you mean by that? Because there's already the 2015 environmental law which has compulsory reporting emissions. So what, what do you mean? You uh, see, uh, reporting right now is done in most parts of the world. Environmental sustainability reporting is done by most companies. Those into the annual report, it has no consequence, meaning you announce these uh, uh, in your uh, report what you have done, how you maybe have reduced your emission footprint, but there's no consequence, there's no sanction, there's no incentives. It can only work when you report if there is a legally uh, binding sanction. For example, if from one year to another you have actually increased your, your emissions. The moment it's the reporting obligation, but once it has consequence, real behavior will change. Have those with the environmental law, which is quite amazing. So now it changed it so if a factory is polluting every day, they will be fine. It's just not a, it's not just a one-time fine, and it's not just the company that will be fine. It'll be an individual person. So and you can actually uh, sue government. So at least on emissions. But I, are you talking about reporting on sustainable investing? That's so this is slightly different reporting. So. I'm just going to lay out um, the next, you know, segment what we're going to do here. I'm going to ask Leslie about the types of sustainable finance, the rainbow, so to speak, and then I'm going to go to you for some questions. So if you can start thinking about what you would like to ask Leslie, um, and then I'm going to go back and I'm going to ask Leslie to talk a little bit about China's influence along the Belt and Road, and specifically then about China Africa influence. Okay, it's very broad, um, as you alluded to, and I thought, can we somehow make it simple to understand, <laughs> like, like, lay it out? Um, you, I guess, you know, we can mention green bonds, we can just talk about uh, carbon, uh, carbon tax or whatever, but is there a simple way that you can explain the rainbow and sustainable finance mechanism? Um, maybe I should make a comment and talk about uh, the new development bank and what we do instead of talking about theoretically or philosophical perspectives uh, on this. So, uh, the Development Bank, as I mentioned, was started uh, two years ago, and in the first phase, our first five projects were all renewable energy. Now, why um, 
was that the case? Was it because uh, China, uh, India, South Africa, and so all of them have very strong coal-based energy uh, systems, right? So um, uh, Russia not so much because Russia is actually a close to the energy surplus uh, uh, country. Uh, but in all of these countries, there's already quite a strong drive towards reducing the uh, emissions footprint because the biggest component of emissions that a country like South Africa is actually one single enterprise called ESCOM, which is the electricity provider. So because of the priorities of these governments, we are helping to, to bank, to finance the initiatives to diversify the energy sources away from coal. So essentially, well, what do we do? We, uh, in the case of South Africa, uh, funding a project to connect the independent power producers to the transmission grid. We have independent power producers projects uh, by investors ultimately to be connected to the grid so that that power can then be transmitted uh, and distributed to other households or industries. In, uh, in Shanghai, our first project has also been a renewable energy project in a, called, a company called Lingam in uh, Pudong where we are building 100 megawatts uh, power uh, uh, rooftop solar uh, PV uh, project to provide renewable energy to uh, Shanghai, uh, obviously, yeah, and they for uh, one power for if you look at, at the size of Shanghai. But all of these contribute to changing the overall the overall footprint. Uh, but renewable energy is only one sliver; it's only one component of the uh, energy uh, revolution. At this stage, we are only focused on on uh, infrastructure. As we move, as, as the bank develops the capability, as the bank uh, develops in terms of systems, people, etc., will diversify into the uh, into, into the other areas. What other areas? <laughs> so, for example, let's say you have a big uh, corporation. Uh, let's take energy efficiency. Energy efficiency is not about uh, it's not about building infrastructure. By infrastructure, I mean deploying capital to put in place new uh, a new asset, like building uh, something. Uh, there's significant programs to reduce the existing uh, uh, um, energy footprint of large uh, companies. Right? We don't have a program right now, right now to finance those, but it is certainly part of our mission to help reduce the energy footprint of, of uh, uh, large corporations. And that's so important because a third of all energy is lost, poof, into the air after it's produced, before it gets to your teapot. So it's like putting water into this leaky bucket, a bucket full of holes. So actually the cheapest form of energy is energy efficiency. So I'm really glad to hear that. Okay, so now, if you have thought about your questions, I can take a couple. Ariel Margulis. Do you want to just uh, do this? Yeah, come on up. Okay. Thank you, Peggy, for uh, creating another wonderful uh, event. And thank you, Leslie, for, for coming. Great to meet you. Um, my question uh, has to do with the fact that your uh, headquarters are in Shanghai. I actually had a meeting today where we looked at the beautiful building, the new building in Hong um, And the fact that, if I'm not mistaken, 45% of the capital is from China. And I want to ask about the nature of projects that this bank is going to pursue, and how much of it is going to be Chinese and cater to the one belt one road policy, and how much is it going to be other great other countries that are going to enjoy from whatever you're doing <laughs> the, in other countries of the world as well. Yeah. So, so BRICS, uh, as the beginning. Uh, Brazil, Russia, India, China, and South Africa, these five countries came together to um, uh, form this uh, bank. The interesting aspect about this institution, which I should have mentioned right at the beginning, is that it is owned equally by these five countries. So China has put the same amount of capital. China has, uh, does not have a disproportionate say in the running of the institution. The management comprises of five Declared investment committee of five uh, uh, people, presidents from India, and a vice president each from myself from South Africa, one from Brazil, one from Russia, one from uh, China. And um, the, our aim is to have a balanced portfolio across these five uh, countries. Bank is important in China simply because you know China put a bit to to host the bank. And we also 
impressive bird I should So I can look at it when I when I uh, arrive here. So there's no disproportionate influence that uh, China has. All five member countries are also part of the AIIB, so the One Belt, One Road initiative is really part and harmonious with our medium-term plans. I certainly envisage us doing co-financing projects with the Asian infrastructure as we back along the Belt and Road in Russia, uh, India, connecting China with the neighboring uh, countries, etc. So um, uh, it, it's only in appearance that we have this Chinese character. You might say China's first amount equals, but we are, we, we, we are equal. And the equal shareholding is an interesting construct against the backdrop of what I said earlier on that the shareholding structure in some of our peer institutions does not make sense. The Asian Development Bank is, uh, has always been run by someone from Japan. Uh, Japan is half the size of China, and Japan's stake is double the size of China. It makes no sense in terms of weight, economic weight, political influence, uh, etc. The world has changed, and we need to keep pace with that. With that. So, just to be clear, you're not going to invest in projects outside of the five members. So, at this stage, the bank has these five uh, members. Um, the bank is already, as part of our articles of agreement, part of our establishment, there would be, be an agreement that the bank will expand. At this stage, we only invest in the five countries. However, we will grow and we will eventually, 80% of the equity will be owned by emerging markets and we'll have 20% shareholding from non-borrowing countries, European countries, and, and, and others. But that's going to be part of our growth plan, our growth phase, as we evolve. And then when you started, basically, each of these BRICS countries picked a vice president, and you happen to be the one in South Africa. So you got a call one day from the president and said, hey, dude, what are you doing for the next five years of your life? Right? Six years. Six years of your life. But, but um, they wrote the things that made you with these uh, the And they rotate, yes. But, but, Aren't you in charge of the Treasury? Uh, yeah, well, I look after a number of my, my colleagues here from the Treasury uh, with me. Uh, so I look after these sort of finance uh, Treasury uh, functions of the institutions. What we do is to break it down for the non finance people. We would raise the capital uh, of the banks. So, so essentially, the way these banks work in 30 seconds is as follows you have the equity or the capital from uh, your, your five uh, countries. Uh, that money is uh, invested. Right, for a return, to run your operations, uh, etc. And the real money you deploy for projects, you raise from the debt capital markets and then you on lend. You raise it at a particular pay uh, investors a particular rate of interest and you uh, on lend it for a higher rate of interest and you also then make your return. So you really sort of, you know, lending other people's money if you like. Uh, and through clever structure, you're able to, to grow that portfolio. And you can do all of that because you have. What's called a credit rating, and um, uh, having a very high credit rating is what defines this one's Okay, but my point is that there's five VPs, yeah. and you're in charge of the money at a hundred billion dollar bank. That, that was my point. Okay, next question. Okay. Uh, can you, can you uh, thank you, Mr. Ambassador, and thank you, Mr. Hill, for this wonderful presentation. My name is Yixiu. I work as a communication manager at Chandala, which is the environment of this parcel. Um, my question is really about the, um, the implementation of the investment strategy, because uh, um, over last week, we all know that the uh, annual meeting of AIIB concluded in Jojo, where the energy strategy paper uh, once again became a hot topic, a hot topic, because there was just so much uh, public attention on uh, what the bank is going to uh, invest and what are the challenges to uh, invest on uh, legal managers. Uh, it was and it's very encouraging to hear that all the five projects that the uh, New Development Bank has invested in are focused on legal managers. So um, what, are the specific, uh, what are the specific challenges for the bank to look for legal managers in the five countries and uh, uh, how, how, do you, uh, how do you see the New Development Bank as a uh, you, uh, the emerging fund um, is better positioned to solve those challenges. Thank you. As I mentioned, we are owned by five uh, governments essentially. Each of these governments have infrastructure plans, right? So, in the first phase of our development, we are uh, 
we are drawing in terms of our project pipeline, we are drawing from these five uh, uh, governments, uh, and most of our projects are public sector, are endorsed by the public sector, or have, as we call it, have a sovereign guarantee. As the bank grows, so in other words, uh, it's easy for us to identify potential projects because uh, there's you know, a list of government uh, projects that have already, some of them have already gone through the initial period of screening. For example, let's say the government wants to upgrade a port in South Africa. Right? Um, they, they would know that the throughput of that port uh, needs to be increased and they've got a rough sense of what it will cost if they've done the initial uh, scoping. So we would step in with some of that preliminary work that's already been done. It's rare that you have a completely green fields off the wall uh, project. Right? So there is an enabling environment already that helps us. With, as the bank grows, as the bank evolves over the next five to 10 years, we will expand to also then to the private sector and have a much more of a balanced portfolio because the, the, um, when these banks were set up, multilateral banks, it was done at a time when capital markets were not as developed as they are today. Financial markets were not uh, able to reconstruct Europe after the war and the devastation of 1944. The World Bank had to step in, uh, and that's in fact what the main role the World Bank played for the 40s and 50s, which is rebuilding Japan, rebuilding France, and the European uh, countries. And especially in a lot of the post, uh, post conflict, uh, uh, with Bosnia after the breakup of Yugoslavia, South Sudan, um, Sierra Leone, a lot of countries where there's been devastation, these banks, public loan banks, set in. I guess the short answer to your question is that we, we derive a lot of our initial support from uh, uh, the uh, uh, government. Okay. Yes, sir. Hi, I'm Tom Shudis. I run a financial advisory company and also a lot of my clients is in the water treatment. Um, thanks for your uh, wonderful uh, information and explanations about new development. Um, my question was about um, the severe pollution situations in China in both air, water, soil, uh, water tables as well. Um, for those projects, um, there's a number of uh, public-private partnership structures that are being in discussion in China and I'm not sure how many of them are already in operation. Um, but obviously funding of those public-private partnerships is, uh, I would think, is a big opportunity for, for funding. Um, but um, purely financial performance uh, parameters, uh, the rate of return and so on, on those projects are very difficult uh, to maintain. And so. What other parameters, um, or how do you go about of including other parameters uh, for deciding on such projects uh, that you could do in China, and possibly obviously as well in other uh, countries of the Greece? Thank you. Thank you very much for that uh, question. That question actually goes to the heart of what is the mandate of this bank and other multilateral banks. And I again should have emphasized at the beginning that we are banks, a commercial uh, imperative. However, we are not profit uh, driven. There is no rate of return sort of expectation that uh, you know, the board or the president, in the case of the bank or the treasury team have that we are working towards. We have to be financially sustainable in the medium to long term. Right? So for example, there are several projects in our pipeline where you can see the economic benefits, in other words, the economic uh, in terms of the social in terms of those projects. For example, building rural roads as we are doing now in India does not generate a positive uh, internal rate of return uh, for the bank. But it is critical in terms of the economic infrastructure it provides for that part of, uh, of India. So the kind of projects you describe fall exactly within the scope of what the bank uh, wants to do. We will have a balanced portfolio of projects that fall in this category that with a bigger economic and social return, but not necessarily a financial uh, return, and other more commercial uh, projects. But those kind of um, uh, PPPs, uh, those are exactly the, the uh, projects that we are very keen on uh, funding. Wait, so, no, no rate of return expectations? Well, obviously it's blended, but what I'm describing to you now is that there is no uh, metric where the, there has to be an IRR of you know, 12% or 
said. We look at the uh, balance uh, portfolio. As I said, some of the uh, projects like the rural road will not generate you money in the short term. However, you are contributing to the economic infrastructure with multiplier benefits that come from uh, connecting one province to another. You know, if you build a uh, high speed rail even from here, let's say, one of the biggest things happening in China is to develop central China and western China because more than almost 70% of the GDP of China comes from the eastern and southern parts, right? It's a very unbalanced country. So the next part of the infrastructure growth over the next uh, 20 years in China is to develop a uh, center the west and to connect the western part of China with the rest through the one belt, one road, uh, etc. If you build a high speed rail between a uh, big city in the west now, and uh, Xi'an, but you build a high speed rail. Uh, King's Cross in Britain, in the UK, yeah. they want to connect to Beijing one day. That on high speed rail. We, 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 we believe that there is definite long term uh, demand for a that kind of access. Uh, you have to, the, the benefit we have is that we look at the world from longer term lenses. Typical banks look at the world from very short term lenses because they are shareholders that demand a return, quarterly return. That's why banks take excessive risk, uh, which, which we're not, uh, we not in that business. So, so I'll talk a little bit more about that when we get to Belt Road, but um, I'm now wondering what's the difference between New Development Bank and the Green Fund that was meant to go to uh, developing nations and island nations under the Paris Conference of Parties. Is that right? So that was $100 million or meant to be, I believe. Well, I mean, we, uh, we, we were not a fund. As I said, we are, we are a bank set up by a multilateral treaty where countries come together and establish this thing for prosperity. Fund is something that's set up for a moment in time for a particular purpose and the funds get deployed. This institution will be around, the new building has been put up in Kudong for us over the next few years. It will be you know, an uh, iconic uh, building, one of the leaders in China. And you're going to add this to the house of the Okay, next. <laughs> Uh, hello, Becky. Hello, Leslie. Uh, my name is Mariah. Uh, my question is, um, as you mentioned that um, NDB and AIIB, actually you're running uh, the similar, totally the same even uh, project like infrastructure project like uh, investing the uh, membership countries for the uh, power uh, distribution or railway or road. But um, NDB only covered five countries, but AIIB uh, set up on 2013 and covered uh, by now maybe 70 countries. But China hosted the most uh, um, ratio of the investment. But why China like, uh, uh, like um, expand the NDB's uh, coverage and then change NDB to be AIB or something. Why they started an AIB, AIB uh, for a new uh, a new bug? Uh, yeah, yeah. Why do we need two banks? Yeah. Okay. Um. And uh, sorry. Uh, the other question is: Say you have a total almost the same project, so. Uh, regarding, uh, in terms of the, the, the investment in the five countries, uh, do you like compete with each other, or do you cooperate, cooperate with each other? That's my second question. Thank, Thank you. you. The second question is much easier. We work together very closely with IIB. I was in uh, Jeju Island uh, last week, attending the annual meeting, and uh, we have regular dialogue uh, with them. You see, this is an important system set up roughly around the same time with the only multilateral banks based in China with a very close cooperation. There are very distinct, uh, distinctive uh, differences between our two uh, institutions. The first one is China does not borrow. China's country government doesn't borrow from AIIB. In other words, AIIB, you know, $20 billion of paying capital, $80 billion of affordable capital. There will never be a project of AIIB in China. They don't borrow. They are what they call 
a non-borrowing member of AIAD. So China is effectively a donor. It's very important. China has been you know, a very poor developing country, the bottom of uh, GDP per capita uh, just a generation ago. It is now becoming a donor, a very important donor in the world. So we, on the other hand, China is a borrowing member, which means that there are projects uh, the strongest pipeline from China. Uh, we already have uh, um, uh, energy uh, projects, we looking at offshore wind, and a whole series of other projects in uh, China. So that's the first major distinction. We do not overlap with each other. Uh, we don't go for, for a project to, get, uh, to look at a um, potential funding of the project, and then AIB people will be sitting in the same uh, corridors open to be uh, Number two. We uh, work on creation of BRICS. AIIB is a Chinese creation. The way I look at AIIB, AIIB is really it's part of this new China that has arisen. The China is thinking much more certain, much more bold role in the world. It's kind of almost a Chinese world back in uh, We are back to the emerging markets of the Chinese part of the world. Thank you for asking that yeah. Uh, thank you very much for the very interesting talk. I'm Irina from Bluefuzz, and uh, as I mentioned, and uh, uh, when I was graduating from uh, international relations and political science, uh, I wrote my thesis and was thinking about the um, economic integration of Russia into the Asia Pacific. And uh, five years later, the uh, uh, Bank was set up in Shanghai. And uh, my question is about uh, what are uh, what are the projects to involve Russia economically in uh, cooperation with Asia Pacific in China in particular? We know one Belt and Road, uh, most of the part is built from Russia now. Probably you can um, uh, highlight some uh, projects if uh, they already exist and uh, probably for every five countries. I have a few Russian uh, colleagues here who uh, you want to add to the answer. Hello. Firstly, uh, Introduce yourself. No, here's the question. Dennis. Um, uh, to come to your uh, question, firstly, uh, there's a lot of focus on regional connectivity with these multilateral uh, banks. Just think about it. The, um, uh, you need a multilateral bank, a bank that works across countries look at projects and fund projects that involve more than one country. So one of the strong uh, mandates of the AIIB is to fund regional uh, infrastructure, which is now the to what's called One Belt, uh, One Road. In a similar way, as China seeks to connect the country in a more dynamic way through transport links uh, um, uh, of all kinds, whether it be through rail, ports, etc., um, the same with uh, Russia. Russia is a very large, uh, industrialized, and quite large developed uh, economy. Uh, there is going to be, in my view, I think, a very strong focus on transport links, for example, for so the Moscow design type uh, uh, rail links. There's going to be, I think, uh, projects of that nature that, uh, that the bank will find in the uh, future. So, uh, in all of our five member countries, including Russia, we will look for projects that have regional economic uh, benefits. Because we cannot, at this stage of the world's development, the stage of globalization, uh, look inward. You know, this idea of your country first. If everybody adopts a policy, Russia first, you know, China first, South Africa first, we will get nowhere. But the world is far too interconnected today for something like that to work. So everything we do militates against this idea of, you know, South Africa first, Brazil first, etc. So it's going to be a combination of projects throughout the various infrastructure uh, fields. Um, but in Russia, a particular economic structure where energy, energy for example, is not one of the biggest problems. Uh, so just behind me, I have a map of the Belt and Road. They now shortened it to Belt and Road, one Belt, one Road. Not that that's a better name, per se. <laughs> but just for those of you who need a little introduction, or maybe for those of you who are watching from abroad, the Belt and Road is this vision uh, that will basically transform to a politics around the world. Right? So I, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but I think it's 4 billion people live along these routes. I believe it's 25% of all GDP today. 75% uh, of all natural resources are along this route. 
The belt is basically the rail, and the road, strangely enough, is the maritime route that go to Southeast Asia, to Pakistan, uh, Sri Lanka, down to even Africa. Right. So the vision here is again 50, 100 year vision of transport and making logistics efficient. If people can sell their goods abroad more effectively with shorter <coughs> amounts of time, they can earn more money. With more prosperity, hopefully there will be peace. And the idea is that, that you know, the long-term vision here is not a G20, a new G20, but maybe a new G200, 2000. That's what Brian, <laughs> Brian mentioned. So, you know, this Belt and Road, sorry, we, we, I need to change that title. It's actually Belt and Road, not one Belt and Road anymore. But um, it will completely define geopolitics going forward. And surprisingly enough, when I go around the world, a lot of people haven't yet heard of this concept. Um, so obviously it's not a really good marketing thing, but they, people will. Uh, China is putting in over a billion dollars to <coughs> commit to buy products from companies along this route. They're holding trade fairs in Beijing to showcase the products that they will buy, Chinese buyers will buy. Um, they're giving away scholarships for people in these countries. Uh, they're doing all sorts of things uh, that are trying to create this sort of economic, this fundamental uh, network of logistics, right, transport, in order to boost the economy, essentially, of their neighbors. So it makes sense from China's point of view, but I think it makes sense also for all of the countries, especially the developing nations, along this route. Is there anything that I missed? No, I think that, that's uh, spot on. I mean, essentially, this is an idea, so it's a concept. I don't, I don't think there is a, uh, even in any of the policy makers' minds, a very clear map that says, you know, the road goes from here and the belt. Uh, this is a concept came in 2013 from a speech that uh, President Xi Jinping uh, made and it got instant uh, traction and it's still evolving. So it's an evolving idea around what would be one of the biggest regional economic connectivity or integration projects of our time and pay sense. You know, this thing has come to the uh, horizon or beyond. It's really about the next phase of globalization, right, if, you, if you can, can, can uh, call it that. Um, I think it, it, it's going to get a lot more flesh a lot more uh, um, co uh, concrete detail uh, as to all. So there's a, a burning question in the back. So I'm going to take that one. Yeah. Thank you for uh, coming on out. I uh, really appreciate your information. Uh, my name is Hugh John. I'm actually the founder of a huge black organization in China. So we are actually having a different way of doing things, which is you know, teaching people about Africa so we understand that there's opportunities that we can contribute to sustainability and environmental things. One of the challenges in our organization, which we're doing an event about South Africa next month, is how do we get access to information about these projects? There's a big gap, and I'll talk about the South African government, the likes of corporations and the people. I have the people, they want the information. How do we get the access to that information about these projects we talked about that will fit the one dollar road? My folks don't know. I think uh, many of the institutions are only included. We are obviously uh, new, so we are you know, emerging just out of our sort of startup phase now. Similarly, like AIB, all of these institutions can do a much greater job of uh, using much more effective communication uh, channels to be able to uh, put out their uh, information around what they're doing on the projects. The, the organizations are quite transparent these days in the sense that all of the policies that we develop in bank, some on the web, you can, can comment on it, similar to the World Bank, ADB, all of them, they are very transparent in that regard. And the reason why it's important this transparency aspect because these institutions are all owned by, by, by you, by us, because they are funded by a public mandate and therefore public good institutions. So you have a right 
to ask questions on, on these uh, projects, right? So I guess my first point is that there is a, a commitment by these institutions to be more and more uh, uh, transparent, and which is why I believe there's a very strong role for civil society organizations, NGOs to play uh, in the evolution of these institutions. Because sometimes we sit in ivory towers, ivory towers, and we have, you know, uh, infinite uh, knowledge and, and, and wisdom. It needs to be that interplay between the different formations in civil society and the financiers to craft a, a better way forward. But to come to your specific question around how to get information on projects, our pipeline is not necessarily public knowledge because it's still under construction by definition because it's a pipeline of projects still in development. The projects that have been done, all of that is transparent. You can, you can uh, uh, have a look at the projects. You can also contact the, the bank should you need more information in that regard. Okay, no, no other burning questions, right? Can I move on? <laughs> um, oh, oh, okay, one more burning question. Um, thank you for your information. So I'd like to know, if you know the infrastructure project is a long-term project, so how to manage the currency risks in the whole project for a long term? Thank you very much. It's a really excellent uh, question and it goes to the heart of what these banks uh, have been doing over the last uh, 70 odd years. I mean, as you all know, the US dollar has been, for most of the post-war period, the anchor reserve currency in the world. So all of these banks, uh, including our, our ourselves, our, our capital is in US dollars, we typically raise bonds in US dollars, and we on lend, uh, all of these projects are typically in US dollars. And yet, Projects by definition, if it's local, if it's in China, it could be uh, RMB, if it's in Russia, it could be Google, in South Africa, it could be Iran, and so on, Brazilian Bill. So there is always that, uh, with multilateral projects, there is that sort of currency uh, mismatch where your loan is in, in US dollars, but the revenue from the project is in the local currency. As a result of that, the bank has developed a strategy to embrace more local currency funding. So as part of our business model, we will endeavor to offer uh, local currency products. So here in China, this project I just mentioned, the Lingam project will be building the 100 megawatt power uh, renewable energy here in Pudong, is funded in RMB. We raise the local bond in RMB and we fund the team in RMB. And in that way, you'll have the match between the asset and liability, and therefore the, you, you're taking away, you're helping the borrower uh, avoid the foreign exchange rates. What about Bitcoin and Ethereum? Bitcoin and Ethereum, those of you don't know about the Bitcoin and Ethereum are sort of crypto uh, currencies. The world is moving towards cryptocurrencies, there is no question uh, about it. Uh, the virtual currencies have not really entered the world of multilateral banking yet. I firmly believe that it is part of our future. There is no question that uh, this is. Uh, part of the, the future design of the financial system. Some of the most leading voices in finance, as recently the Deputy Governor of Bank of England, uh, also someone from the Fed uh, in the US, spoke about the future of cryptocurrency, saying that you know, it is indeed conceivable that, that the countries will, will move towards uh, virtual currencies in time uh, to come. Um, but at this stage, it doesn't impact on our uh, business models because. Uh, it is still a uh, concept. Obviously, these, are, these, kind of, these cryptocurrencies have been traded actively today. In fact, they have managed to skyrocket uh, recently. Uh, people have made fabulous amounts of, uh, of money. The real problem is how do you regulate? Remember, we are public good institutions, right? Uh, in the world of cybersecurity, which I believe is probably the single biggest risk facing the world today, in the sense that the physical world. And the, the digital world is merging and coming together in ways that was never uh, in business before. So what does that mean? It means that you could have much bigger economic disruption through, I'll give you one concrete example, in 2015, December, there was a cyber attack in Ukraine 
and then to power uh, outage uh, um, and affected about 250,000 uh, people. So this is not because there was a shortage of power, it was actually a cyber uh, attack. Um, but it leads to real economic hardship where people now do not have uh, kind of a moment to have access to the most basic power. Imagine something that happened in winter. Right? All of these systems are in digital world. So cryptocurrency is not quite yet part of the market that we in the world, but it's, uh, there are active investigations looking at what its future might mean for the industry. So I'm going to ask Leslie one more question. Before I do that, I wanted to point out that if you want to come to any of our future JUICE events, that you can scan this QR code. And there are a couple events already in the works. Uh, one of them is Helen High, who's a mutual friend of ours. She's an ambassador for UNIDO, which is the United Nations Industrial Development Organization. And she's also the CEO of Made in Africa, or Resort made for Africa, one of, one of uh, those two. And she's a fascinating woman from Shanghai who has single-handedly, I think, brought the Chinese manufacturing model into China in a successful, replicable way. She consults to eight presidents in Africa on how to bring part of the 85 million light manufacturing jobs from China into Africa. So that will be Saturday, uh, July 13th at 3.30 p.m. at another Naked Hub location on Hunan Lu. And again, you can scan this QR code later if you'd like to have an announcement on that sent to you. And then uh, just for fun, on July 4th for dinner, we're having a healthy potluck to celebrate food heroes all around Shanghai. So you bring a dish, and that's your entrance fee. And it's good for families as well, so if you have kids, feel free to bring them. Um, last time we had a great time at the Nanjing Lu Make It Hope location. So I'll just leave this QR code up for you to scan. And I'm going to close uh, with Leslie's portion here by asking you what you think the future of China African relations hold in a, in a more insightful manner than just, oh, good. <laughs> Um, Africa, as many of you uh, might know, consists of three uh, countries. And often, when you speak about uh, one continent, uh, it's kind of condensed into, in, into one. That's so, just Sarah Palin, Palin, nobody else. <laughs> so, so I think it's important to uh, <laughs> say that there are limitations to which one can sort of use this uh, term. But there are some very unique, distinguished aspects about this uh, continent that I think is, is important. One of the first things to know about uh, what's happening in the world right now in general with economies is that demographics has a very, very important critical, critical ingredient in the economic uh, trajectory. The reason why Japan is, what well, it is today, one of the uh, most formidable economies in the world and destined to become the biggest uh, as a career uh, since 1650, uh, until the decline of the late, uh, the late years. China is a maturing society. And China will unfortunately uh, grow old before it grows rich, uh, to use that analogy. So Japan uh, was able to grow uh, rich. It's quite a rich uh, society before it uh, grow old. But there's a major problem with demographics. Africa, we come back to Africa. Africa is uh, the opposite side of the spectrum. There's the youngest population of the continent as a whole. Population growth is much, much higher. Uh, we will have the single biggest uh, population uh, in the world uh, in terms of our, our contribution to the labor force. I see the numbers recently, kind of the exact number now, but I think it's from the labor force. The labor force of people are able to work uh, with over a billion. The moment the population is a billion, we talk about people who are now obviously very young, uh, who will enter the labor force. Uh, Africa will um, be uh, a very, very uh, critical part of China. Why? Because Africa is still, uh, many countries have it's not gone through industrialization. Uh, there's a huge demand uh, to the, the process that China has gone through each growth over the last generation, over the last 30, 40 years, has not reached some of those uh, countries. So right now, a lot of people skeptically say that part of one road is 
a transfer of the excess capacity of China towards the, the rest of this one dot one, one road uh, countries, meaning China deploying its, its own capacity in steel, aluminium, and heavy industries towards. Similarly, I think a lot of people recognize that China will have a major role to play in the industrialization process of, uh, of the rest of Africa. There's a very tight relationship between these two continents because of the commodity links. China needs a lot of resources that come directly from, from Africa, hard coal, commodities such as copper, nickel, uh, coal, everything they import from, from uh, uh, commodity exporting countries. And um, uh, what is likely to happen in my view is that you see a, a growth in multinationals in the manufacturing or those companies that contribute to industrialization will play a significant role in the industrialization of Africa. But let me just add, it is not a simple process, a linear process. There are many companies right now, large numbers of companies that are completely controlled, that are not going through the stages that China have gone through. For example, we have large parts of East Africa right now propelled by, by Kenya that have uh, um, mobile payment system is more advanced and it's at the level of WeChat uh, um, you know, and these are poor countries, right? So there are, there are large numbers of people who never have bank accounts who only have mobile payment uh, applications. So Africa also has the benefit of learning from China, learning from these countries and skipping a generation of technologies. So I'm so grateful to be your friend. Thanks for having me. Uh, I mean, no, no matter how much money, if, if it's a hundred cents <laughs> or a hundred billion dollars, I, I, I mean, the most important thing is I'm grateful. Uh, if you have a chance to come up and say hi later before Leslie has to leave, I highly recommend at least shaking his hand, saying hello. Um, and if, if I could also ask you to do one thing before you leave, it's to introduce yourself to somebody who you don't know and just connect. Okay, because that's, I, mean, I know a lot of you guys in this audience, or you guys, you, you guys are all really special, but you don't know each other. So please connect. So with that, I think I'm going to introduce our principal guest again. Thank you, Leslie. invited by the World Academy for the Future of Women to come to Senzo, China in a program called Give Women Voice with the Arts. And she actually trained Chinese people with a little bit of music, with a little bit of creativity and innovation, with a little bit of love. So with that, I'd like to reintroduce you to help close out our evening to T-Bird Love.
basically the story about how you got into this nature of sound. So everyone always asks me, how do you do that? And um, Leslie was talking about uh, having a lot of wonderful people, mentors, support you in your life. And I was very fortunate to have that. Uh, starting from a very young age, I always had teachers who saw something in me and helped me see that in myself. And um, while I was at Carnegie Mellon studying to be an orchestral musician, I met a fantastic, wonderful mentor, actually in the newspaper. He was selling an alto flute at the time, and I hadn't seen one of those or a bigger version of this. And I decided to head over to his place to check it out. And he answered the door, playing the flute. And he had bass flutes, and prepared pianos, and instruments he had hybrided together. And he turned out to be a professor at Carnegie Mellon, but in the art department. And his name is Michael Petzl. And Michael started taking me to an aviary, a bird sanctuary on Sunday mornings, telling me to listen to the sounds of birds, and to imitate the sounds of birds. And from that moment, I realized that music was so much more than just music on the page, or just improvising, but actually tuning in with the muse of nature. And it unfolded my life, connected more with nature, um, uh, with meditation, uh, with sound healing, uh, with listening to water and different sounds, and listening to, in many ways, I feel that nature or spirit uses me as a vehicle. And how, for me, music is so much more than just standing here entertaining people. It's about creating transformation, touching your heart, and sparking imagination so that we can imagine where we're going, <laughs> so that we can take the steps to do the things we want to create. So, little bit of my background and I feel really, really blessed to be able to share that with all of you tonight here in the room and in the world out there. So thank you very much for that. So just out of curiosity, how many of you would be interested in a longer session with T-Bird on creativity? Well, everyone's hands would be raised. Of course. Yeah. Of course. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Good. All right. Well, with that, we're very grateful as Juice and PWC to have you here in the audience, but also hopefully as participants now that we have free flow beer and coffee and tea and all these wonderful people. So good night and hope to see you next time. <laughs>